Well, pastors in North Dakota, as Rory said, in that nice balmy weather area, we have a granddaughter that lives up in Williston, and uh, she keeps us updated on the weather, and it's not very pleasant a lot of times. So I hope they're having good weather. Uh, pastor assigned me the title, and he assigned me the scripture to preach this morning. So that's what we're going to look at. Empty treasure. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, I do pray that today you will bless your word. Help us to see that uh, the things of this earth are really not worthy, worth pursuing. But God pursuing you is. And we pray that we might have heavenly treasure. I pray today that God, you will keep my voice clear. Might I speak only words, only words that you would have me to speak. And God, that you would just enable, because I cannot do it. I pray your Holy Spirit will work. In Jesus' name, amen. If I were a rich man, yubby-dibby-dibby-dibby-dibby-dibby-dum, all day long I'd biddy-biddy-dum. If I were a wealthy man, wouldn't have to work hard, etc. How many would like that? <laughs> yeah. Fiddler on the roof, tell you thought it would be great just to have a small fortune, he says. And uh, you know, there's a lot of people in this world that would like to have more than a small fortune. They'd like to have a big fortune. And I've discovered from listening to people and uh, <coughs> listening to Shark Tank, how many of you have ever listened to Shark Tank, watched Shark Tank? Mr. Wonderful, do you know who he is? <clears throat> How many times have you heard him say, it's all about the money, it's all about the money, I love the money. And that's what we're talking about today, that's empty treasure, because scripture says something about that. And then there are many people that pay, play publisher's clearinghouse, and that's fine, do that, it's free, it doesn't cost you a penny to put your thing in, but you know, it also says, and by the way, these rules just came to me this two days ago. It says here, enter as often as you like. And evidently people do. Because you know your odds of winning the $7,000 a week for life? You know what they are? It's right here. They're official. One in six billion, two hundred million. Hmm. I don't believe in luck, but lots of luck. <laughs> to win the, thousand, or to win the million dollars, you have an opportunity in one in three billion, four hundred and seventy-eight thousand. Doesn't sound like very good odds to me. I'd rather trust God where he says, I will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And then there's the lottery, and I hope you as Christians don't play the lottery. Why you waste God's money on that? And I, I was looking up on the lottery the other day for the fun of it. And someone researched this. And it says the new, I just heard this in the news the other day too, the new, uh, the new Hampshire woman who won the $559.7 million Powerball jock, jackpot last month is refusing to claim her prize until she's assured anonymity. And she may have a compelling reason to seek the guarantee. It turns out winning a jackpot of millions or even thousands of dollars can lead to financial ruin or even death. Several recent lottery winners have turned up dead in communities across the country. Abram Shakespeare, who won $31 million in Flora's lottery, was found buried in a makeshift grave under a concrete slab less than three years later. A woman who befriended him and offered to help manage the remainder of his winnings instead of murdered him, she was sentenced to life in prison. Jeffrey Damper won the Illinois lottery jackpot worth $20 million. He eventually moved his family to Florida and invested some of his earnings in the business there. On July 26, June 2005, Dampier was murdered by his sister-in-law, Victoria Jackson, and her boyfriend. 2007 Georgia Lottery and Doris Murphy, 42, had planned to use her $5 million winnings to start a trust fund for her grandchildren. According to lottery officials, however, she was found stabbed to death in her home a year later. Murray's ex-boyfriend was charged in her death. Then it says, of the thousands of lottery winners I knew, a few were happy and few lived happily ever after. 
Edward Ogle, author of Money for Nothing, One Man's Journey Through the Dark Side of the Lottery Millions, told the Daily Beast that you would be blown away to see how many winners wish they had never won. Oh, the lure, the lure of finances, of money. How much better to trust God. We are going to look at Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 19 today, <clears throat> if you want to turn there. The order that Christ followed in chapter 6 I find is very interesting. In the first 18 verses where we are conducted into the inner sanctuary where we have our hearts occupied with him who is in secret. And then we find in verse 19 on we come out to face the temptations and trials of the world. And you know this order must be followed in our daily life if we're going to be successful. We must seek God in the inner sanctuary. We must find him in our quiet time, in our private time, and then go out and face the world. <clears throat> and God says that's the order that he takes in this chapter. <clears throat> I'm going to look first of all at the earthly treasure in verse 19. <clears throat> where it says, lay not up for your treasures, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. <clears throat> Just stopping there for a moment. I want to examine the earthly treasure. This earthly treasure, treasures on earth are attractive, they're useful, and seemingful, seemingly essential. But I've jotted down here in my notes some things that it is not wrong regarding earthly treasure. It is not wrong to lay up for your children. 2 Corinthians, 2, or 2 Corinthians 12, 14. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you and will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you, for the children ought to not lay up for their parents, but the parents for the children. But if any provide, 1 Timothy 5, 8, any provide not for his house, he has denied the faith and is worth an infidel. It is not wrong to lay up for the needy. Ephesians 4, 28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. It is not wrong to have wealth if we remember the Lord, Leviticus 8, 18, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth power to get wealth, that he may establish the covenant which he sware unto his fathers, as it is this day. And so there is a reason to, get, to build up some, some finances. There's a reason to set money aside. There's a reason that it, and a place it should be used. And we've talked about those. But we need to realize, as we read in Leviticus, it is, a, it is God that gives the power to even earn the paycheck that you and I earn today. It is God that gives that ability. It is wrong, the excessive seeking after worldly wealth. And you're familiar with this portion in 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. But they that will be rich fall into a temptation and a snare. In many foolish lusts, which drown men in perdition and destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced them through, themselves through with many sorrows. That love of money means an insatiable desire, insatiable desire to have wealth, to pursue wealth. That's your goal, to make money, to build up your own income, to build up your own finances for your own purpose of using it. It is wrong. And many times as we've looked, even read even from that with the lottery, it is a bad thing to do for that purpose. It is wrong to seek earthly goods at the price of forsaking heavenly wealth. When I was dean at Faith in the summer, I went out and I visited, a couple summers, I visited every senior in high school that was uh, named or listed in Faith's records. And I would go to their home and I would sit down with the mom and dad and that high school student and talk to them about that young person's future. And I would not push Faith Baptist Bible College, they need to go there. I said, you need to know God's will. If you are to go to Faith Baptist Bible College, here's what we have to offer. Here's what it is. And I tell you, I was absolutely shocked when I sat down with several parents, and the dad would say something like this. I don't want my son or daughter to go to Faith Baptist Bible College or any Bible college, because I don't want them to go into that ministry where they cannot make big money. I want them to pursue business where they can support their families and they can have many things in their life 
many material blessings. And I thought, wow, how sad that is. And we, I say this as a little sidelight, we as, as parents, and we've done, we did this with our kids, and two of them went into ministry, one uh, daughter and her husband to Taiwan as missionaries, but we prayed, God, take our kids first and put them into your service, and if not, then close that door and put them someplace else. But you see, these parents were more concerned about the material things their kids could have. It is wrong to put our trust and confidence in earthly things that we have treasured up rather than God's supply, and God will supply all of our needs. It is wrong to lay up for ourselves treasures without regard to using the same for the good of others and the support of the gospel. I think the word treasures gives us kind of a clue. We are not to make treasures of our possessions. And someone has said, the test lies not in what a man possesses, but what possesses him. If you recall in Matthew chapter 16, if you want to turn there just quickly, Matthew chapter 16, you read about the rich young ruler, or Matthew 19, I'm sorry, Matthew 19, verse 16. And it says here, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is one good, but uh, none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter to life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear fault witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth. What lack I? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven, and again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now there's some things that maybe uh, you don't understand or you might not understand that scripture. It doesn't say that rich men cannot be saved. I know many that are born again are giving to God. But in this case, this man's riches were his God. And he didn't want to give up anything to follow God. And we know that in order to really serve Christ, when he is our Savior, we need to give him our all, our all. The test lies, like I said, not in what possesses us, but what possesses him, not what possesses the man. We are not required to sell all, but God knows this man's riches kept him between himself and God. Then let's look at the eternal treasure in verse 7, or verse 20, I mean. Verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, this includes the souls we have won to God, we have had the privilege of leading to Christ, the things we've done to influence others for him, the prayers, the kindnesses, the testimonies, and giving to him not only our material things, but our all. Christ wants our all, and that includes our pocketbook. By the way, if he is not Lord of this, he's not Lord of your life. If he is not Lord of what's in your bank account, he is not Lord of your life. F.B. Meyer, Dr. F.B. Meyer used to say, what you invest in ministering to others is capital laid up in God's bank. Capital laid up in God's bank. Psalm 16, verse 5 and 6, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance, and of my cup thou maintainest not. The lines are fallen out into me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Jesus is the one that is our treasure. Colossians 2, 3 tells us that in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man. Think about this. The things which God has prepared for them that love him. Not riches. Love him. Think of what God has prepared for those that put him first. In 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 15, we see that much of our treasure will be burned, and you're familiar with that portion, that every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. A reward. 
If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. In other words, putting nothing in the bank of heaven, just living for material things and the things of this earth. And so we see the earthly treasure, eternal treasure. Now I want to go back to verse 19 and examine the treasure. Notice in verse 19, laying up, not up for yourselves, treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. There's very little security in earthly treasure. I heard a program some time ago of five, the five richest men in the world. And uh, there was, it was an interview. And each one of them told how many times they had made their millions and billions and something had happened and they lost all of it and had to start over and they built it up again and lost all of it. Some of them four or five times losing what they had. And we see that in their scripture. There's little security in earthly treasure. And it says here in this verse that thieves may steal it, the moth may corrupt, rust may spoil it, time will decay it, failure may take it, friends may borrow it and not return it, and death will say, you must leave it. You've never seen a hearse hauling a U-Haul. Never. You can't take it with you. The moth, part of the riches of the Oriental was uh, these garments, the beautiful clothing and fine garments. And so this is telling us that the moth would get in and eat those garments and destroy their treasure, which was a great treasure. And then the next thing, it says rust. And it's kind of interesting because I was looking up on that word rust. I, I didn't understand completely. And I found this. The word translated rust does not here signify rust of metals. <clears throat> or gold or silver, by which there is not so much damage done, so as to destroy them <clears throat> and make them useless, but whatever corrupts and consumes things edible as blasting and mildew in corn or any sort of vermin in granaries. In other words, it's talking about mice and vermin coming in to their storage, into their grains, and into their corn, and eating it and destroying it, and mildew that would come. And so he says, this can happen to your, to your treasure. It, uh, the, it can be eaten away uh, by, by uh, either moth, or it can be eaten away by, by other things, by rodents and so on in that day. And there's many things today that can destroy and make us lose our treasure. And then notice the next thing is thieves break through and steal. I call this the marauders. Those that come in and steal. And the third kind of wealth was gold and silver. And it, it was interesting to me that these coins would be placed in a jar of some sort, and then they would dig down in their dirt floor, and they would bury that jar. And that's where their treasure would be head, but, held, but it provided very little security because it was easy for the thieves to dig through the wall or dig underneath the wall and steal that jar of gold and silver. In fact, I found it also interesting that the Greeks called a burglar a mud digger. Because the word break in the Greek is really the word dig. And so they call these thieves, here comes a mud digger, and a mud digger would dig through the wall or the, underneath the house and steal that, that jar. And then you look at eternal treasures in verse 20 where it says that where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break steel, through and steal. And I thought about this and I jotted down some things that are, that they are these are really enduring in nature. Think about it. Eternal treasures. They're incorruptible in its texture. They're safe in its keeping. God is the keeper of those treasures. God is the keeper of them. Heavenly in its origin. Holy in its character. Ennobling in its possession. And truly worth having. These treasures will not vanish, diminish, or tarnish. How much better to lay aside treasure in heaven where God has supplied for us an eternal inheritance and a keeping of the things that we do for Jesus Christ here as deposited in the bank of heaven. And you know, if Jesus is not Lord of the life, we do not have that kind of insight. We want material things. We want material things. There are five things in connection with this laying up a treasure, a child's treasures in heaven. First of all, the finding of the treasure. 
We only find that treasure in Jesus Christ and in service for him. You know, the sad thing is there are a lot of Christians, a lot of people who receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior, but in their lifetime, they have never served him. They have not witnessed to anyone. They have not taken a responsibility in a local church. They have not done anything to serve Christ other than accept the salvation that Jesus offered. Not laying up anything. In other words, kind of bankrupt in the treasures of heaven. And we need to ask each one of us, each one of us need to ask, Lord, what would you have me to do? How would you have me to serve? I want to lay up treasures in heaven. And you might say, I don't have any talents. I would remind you that God uses the weak and the foolish and the unwise to serve him. I'm too shy. There's someone at least as shy as you that you can tell about Jesus Christ. And so we need to lay up treasures in heaven. And these treasures that we lay up in heaven will not vanish or diminish or targe. And the finding of the treasure is only found in him. Second thing about, about this, these treasures, the treasure must be highly prized and valued. Listen to Paul. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I might win Christ. Wow. When you study Paul's life, you get a little bit of an idea what he was talking about. You go to Corinthians and you look at the, all the things that Paul suffered. He said, I'm ready to give up the ease of life. I'm ready to give up my old way of life. I'm ready to give up all these things that I might be all that God wants me to be. And Paul suffered greatly for the cause of Christ. But wow, can you imagine what's laid up in the bank of heaven for the Apostle Paul? Wow. Wow. We need to realize that it's giving God our all that is necessary. The third thing, we must make this, our, our, this treasure our own. We must make this treasure our own. Proverbs 2, 3, and 5. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and listest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, Thou shalt, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. We need to claim these treasures for our own and then ask God to help us to seek him, to seek in his word, to seek the lost, to find this treasure that will put this deposit in the bank of heaven to our account to the honor and praise of God, not us. We must make this treasure our own. And that's what the world wants to do. They want to make this material thing, the money, all this, all that money can buy. They want to make that all their own. And we want to claim it for God. The fourth thing, we must labor to assure it unto ourselves. Do this, to do this, we must obey Paul's charge to the rich men that we found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17 and 19. And I read that portion here. It says in verse, 1 Timothy 6. Um, let's see here. 1 Timothy 6. I've got to get the right. Here we are. 19. 17 and 19. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth richly all things to enjoy that they do good and they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Look at that text. Wow. Don't be high-minded. Sometimes when people have a lot of things, they think they have certain rights. They have... They, have, uh, they can do what they want because they're rich, and they get special privileges because they're rich. 
God says that that is not right. And no, not right at all. But they trust in those uncertain riches. But in the living God who gives to richly all things to enjoy. Just think, God wants to give all things unto us. He wants us to be joyful. He wants to enjoy it. That, all, that they that do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute. Ready to distribute. And that tells me that we are to share. We're not to keep it to ourselves, but the things that, material things that God gives us, if we are not sharing them and using them for the glory of God, that is sin. That is sin. And then we must use this treasure. Number five, we must use this treasure. Use a, to use our treasure rightly, we must turn our earthly goods into heavenly. Proverbs 19, 17, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he repay again. There we go. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. And so when we help those that are less fortunate, when we help those that are, that are suffering material-wise and not have the goods of this earth, and we are willing to take what God has given us, no matter how little we have, to share that, God says he will repay and I can tell you from experience, folks, that you can never, ever, ever outgive God. Never can outgive God. And so we see this matter of the treasure. Now exalting the treasure in verse 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It is true that you will never make a fortune if your heart isn't in it. And I believe there are two implications by Jesus here in his Sermon on the Mount. In his statement that for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I believe there's two implications. One, our heart will influence our treasure. No doubt our heart will influence our treasure, spiritually or materially. If we love what we are after, we will prosper. And I believe if our heart is set in the accumulation of, of great heavenly fortune, it will inevitably come. God will put aside in the bank of heaven... If that is our treasure, earth, or heavenly things, and serving him, he will deposit it. Secondly, not only will our heart influence our treasure, but our treasure will influence our heart. Our treasure will influence our heart. If our treasure is heavenly, that will affect our living. It will affect our features. It will affect what we do. It will affect everything about us. If our heart is set on heavenly fortune, it will be evident on our faces, on our actions, on our attitudes, and what we do to serve others. Psalm 62 10 says, If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. If your riches increase, set not your heart upon them. And the question is, where is your heart? Where is my heart? Where, what do we put first in our life? You know, I heard some, uh, uh, someone say one time that you show me your credit card bill and you show me your checkbook and can I tell you where your heart is? You know, there's some truth to that. And what we, what we spend our money on and how little we give to God compared to what we do for self. You know, uh, I've, you've heard me say it before, but tithing is not a New Testament principle. Tithing is taxes in the Old Testament. If you study carefully, you'll find there, were, there, were, there was tithing, which were taxes, and there was free will giving in the Old Testament. And every case, every case in the Old Testament where there's free will giving, it always talks about their heart being stirred, their heart right with God. And it tells me something that if our hearts are right with God, our hearts are stirred with the things of Jesus Christ, we are thrilled with the word of God, we're thrilled not only he saved us, but the privilege of serving him. If he is the Lord of our life, it tells me we are going to have our hearts stirred, and it will cause us to give with joy abundantly. In the New Testament, giving likewise, if you study it carefully, 
It's not the tithe. I personally think the tithe is a place to begin. But in the New Testament also, it's talking about our hearts being right with God and giving joyfully as he has blessed us. It's not so much of what we give, but what we have left. Because every penny that you have in your checkbook, every penny you have in your IRA, every penny you have in your saving account, and I have in mine, every penny as a Christian is not mine, it's God's. We are only stewards of it. And we need to realize that there's a world out there that's lost. You know, I said the tithe isn't, for the, isn't the New Testament. It's not taught in the New Testament. It's no, not. I personally think it's a place, just a place to begin, in my own feeling. But I think under grace it calls for more. But I, I know this for a fact, that if every Christian would just tithe in our churches... All of our missionaries would be at full support without any problem and not have to go out for months and months and years raising support. But there's a lot of people in our churches. I'm not just talking here. I'm talking in general. In churches today, fundamental churches, there's a lot of people that hang on to their money, the material things, rather than trusting God and seeing him bless abundantly. Jody and I can tell you from experience, that I tell you, you withhold and God won't bless, you give and God blesses. It's a truth of scripture, truth of scripture. So we talk about exalting the pleasure. We need to have our treasure in heaven. And then you go on in verse 22 and 23. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Here he's talking about the eye gate. Many Bible scholars believe that this is referring to a matter of man's understanding. Understanding the truth about earthly treasures and heavenly treasures. And Psalm 82, 5 says, those without understanding walk in darkness. And that's basically what it's talking about with the, with the evil eye here. Ephesians 1, 18 tells us that the eyes of our understanding need to be enlightened. In verse 21, it talks about the heart. And, and that's talking about our affections and what we treasure. In verse 24, the, it was serving God and, and riches. It is the will that is primarily in view and and in verse 22 and 23, we have the understanding in mind. This means we have the affections, the understanding, the will, all consider, which makes up the entire man. And the fruit of the single eye is a body full of light. And the, and the evil eye is one that's without real understanding, pursues ungodly things and the riches of the world, and it's full of darkness. You know, it's interesting when you go shopping and... Uh, they try and display things so it's so attractive to the eye. Or you walk into the car dealership and you're going to get your oil changed and boy, they got all those new cars all shined up and so pretty and clean. And whatever it is, they want you to see this. And so many people say, I see it, I have to have it. I see this latest technological thing. I see it, I got to have it. I know people that way that... They see something, it's the latest, I gotta have it. I gotta have it. But we need to have an eye that is upon God and sees the, the blessing of seeing heavenly treasure and serving Jesus rather than things of this world. And then in verse 24, we see the examples of this truth. <clears throat> no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. <clears throat> he cannot serve God in riches. All through this part of Christ's sermon, he is separating the precious from the vile. You think about this, he is discriminated between two worshipers, the genuine and the hypocrite. 
He is uh, between the two treasures, the earthly and the eternal. Between two eyes, the single and the evil. And now he's talking about two masters. To serve God is the same as laying up treasure in heaven. To serve riches is the same as laying up treasure upon earth. And when Christ declared, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, he's using a word that is signifying masters that are diametrically opposed. One good, one evil. One heavenly, one earthly. And God says that you cannot serve both. You cannot go down the middle of the road and say, oh yes, I want all these material things. I'm going to pursue riches for this earth and then say that you're serving God. No, it can't be done. You cannot serve God and riches very clearly here. And so when Christ declared that, he's he, talking about, like you said, two things diametrically opposed to each other. They cannot find uh, to be together. One, com one commands, walk by faith, the other by sight. One to be humble, the other proud. One to set your affections on things above, the other on things in the earth. One to look at things eternal, the other to look at things that are temporal. One to be content with what you have, the other covet things more than God. One to distribute, the other to withhold. And again, ye cannot serve God and riches. That is an absolute, a scripture that cannot be changed. And as I went through that list, I, I trust you look in your own life, as I look in my life, am I really serving God? Am I really laying up treasure in heaven? Everything else is empty treasure, empty treasure. We need to have the examination of self. What is your treasure? Are you giving God your all? I don't mean just all. Do you put money in the offering plate? You do good to the poor, but giving him your all. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Does he have first place? If he is not the Lord of your life, then he is, money is the Lord of your life. It comes down to the condition of the heart. And the question is, what, what's our heart like? When Jesus is Lord or the world our treasure? We need to examine our heart and ask God, God, take my all. I want you to be Lord of my life. Father, I pray this morning that you will bless your word. It's so easy to be allured by the world's riches, world's treasure. God, the things the world has to offer, they look so tempting, look so good. And yet, God, if that's our goal, we are only laying up treasures upon earth. And God says that's sin. I pray this morning that we might give him our all, our life, our finances, our family, and God, help us to serve faithfully and lay up treasures in heaven. And we'll thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen.